When it came to the design of a Bluetooth speaker, I really didn't know what to do. But I did have three design styles in mind I kind of liked. One was the funky 50s and 60s retro style. Another one was steampunk. And of course, Art Deco. I think I just went on the internet and typed in something like Art Deco Radio, and these little gems popped up. So I wasn't really looking for a design that I could copy outright. I was more looking for some design elements. And Art Deco was full of them. So I started to formulate some ideas. In this design, for instance, you can see some of the elements that I'm re referring to. There's this sort of fluting look along the edges, and there's a center piece that has a, like a dial or something in it uh, that's very common for this era. In this one, you can see um, more of the center dial idea as well as the use of fine woods. In this one, you can see uh, the dial again and the fine woods, of course, but also there's this trend toward asymmetrical designs, and I really like that. And in this one, you can see that um, there's a trend toward using very soft edges. There aren't a lot of sharp corners in Art Deco. In addition, you get these sort of louvered or sort of very thick um, grill sections uh, that I incorporated. This design has uh, more of those louvers I was referring to. And in addition, it has it's made out of um, an early plastic called Bakelite. It has this very dark brown appearance that was also very common between the 1920 and 1940s or so when the Art Deco period was in style. And here you can see the very thick sort of, um, I don't know, in this case it looks like wood uh, grill sections covering the speaker area. And again, the rounded corners and a sort of centralized dial. So this is what I came up with. And as you can see from this drawing, the original idea was to actually make the unit sort of black with some gray accents. I also reversed that and had a design that was gray with black accents, but we both preferred the black. Later I decided to ditch both of those, obviously, and uh, you'll see why here shortly. So the next step was to take those very drawings and uh, break them into their individual pieces that I would need to machine and uh, convert them to uh, EPS files. Uh, it's a little like a DXF. And it's what the VCARV program that I use to create the G code that runs the CNC mill needs. And uh, then I just started machining. So I don't usually look, I usually don't work with wood. Uh, metal is my material of choice. And I'm not very artistic, so I can't freehand anything. If I tried to make this manually, I would have really messed it up. But I have a CNC router, so I was able to draw it and have these parts, have the machine cut these parts out. And as you can see, it's coming along quite nicely. So here's the ebony stain. It said the longer you leave it on, you're supposed to wipe it off within two or three minutes, and the longer you leave it on, the darker it gets. So I left this for two, this for four, this for five, and frankly, I don't see a whole lot of difference between any of them. But as I was wiping, I noticed you can wipe more or less, and obviously the more you wipe, the lighter it gets. And of course, I can also do a second coat. I decided to leave this one on for a really long time just to see how it goes, because I kind of like this really, really, really dark stain here. Let me back it out a little. Um, so I'm just going to let this go for quite a while and then see if anything even comes off. In the meantime, I'm doing this one for two, four, and five minutes as well. So I built my little router table here and I was so excited because I did it with just a piece of wood. 
I mean, it's not super accurate or anything, but you know, it was doing a great job, and I was, <laughs> I was just so pleased with my genius, you know, of having done this. Uh, otherwise, I had to go buy one. It'd been a couple hundred bucks, or at least a hundred bucks, and I would have to leave, and I'd have to or order something, and I was just gonna say, oh, look what you can do. You know, if it's just little stuff, you can be a genius like me. And then on the third pass, it just uh, stopped working. And I thought I blew a fuse, but I didn't. And I thought maybe it overheated, but it's not that hot. And actually, it's over the slot in this table and actually gets airflow. So I don't know what the deal is, but this is actually pretty typical for when I do work. Stuff like this happens to me all the time. Sometimes it's my fault. This may be too, I don't know. Sometimes it's not. So I didn't quite get done with the third pass on this. It was going great, but you know, I think I think maybe it's time I just uh, head inside because I'm slowly being killed by the laws of thermodynamics out here. It's 92 degrees and 61% humidity, and I think I'm gonna die. So maybe tomorrow. Hey, I took another look at it just before I went inside, and it turns out I am a genius. Uh, it turned out that on the bottom, I guess I manipulated it enough. There's a lock there that locks uh, the shaft so that you can take out the bits and change them. And I guess the lock came, you know, unlocked, or it went from unlocked to locked so that the thing wouldn't turn. And so when I corrected that, hey, got it working again. All right, gonna do my other pass. Woohoo! So here's how the Art Deco Bluetooth speaker's coming along. Um, I cut this groove using my little table and this groove back there on my little table so that um, it helps hold it together much better when you're um, when I'm assembling it and gluing it I think but also uh, and, and it precisely locates it which is nice but also um, I just had a little extra hanging off the edge there so I need to recess it a little bit to get it to fit so you can see the, how the front's coming out it looks really good. It's not gonna be, it's not the best audiophile design, right? Because this speaker is set back and therefore has a smaller volume and different distance. And, and here I, I beveled this uh, opening for the speaker, which I've seen online is it doesn't really help, I guess. But I mean, it might be better than a sharper one here, which I'm probably going to leave. I mean, I'll get rid of the flash, but. So then it kind of looks like this. And then the other little pieces, and they fit in like this. And I made sure I put that groove in such a way that there's a little tiny lip there for these to sit on. So that's really handy too. And they just kind of build up like this as I go across. And I think after I put these in and get it kind of glued together, that's when I'm going to take, you know, sand this down to make it all nice and smooth because they just need to be held in place. I'm afraid if I do them separately, they won't match uh, up to the overall device um, perfectly. So I think it's best, I may be totally wrong. I, like I said, I really don't, really don't work with wood. So uh, then across here, the last thing I have to make, um, I even have the back and I have all the electronics I need. The back's gonna go on like that. And I made it just a tiny bit big because I intend to to put a couple of cut lines there, which will shorten it, right? In order to put a little door to access the batteries and stuff. Some kind of door, I haven't figured that out yet. Um, so all that's essentially done except um, the, the slats that go across here and the ones I think I'm gonna add to match it that go across here. Um, I wanted to see, I wasn't sure where this panel was gonna go. So I wanted to see where it was first to see where all the notches and stuff will need to go. So now that I know that, I could take some measurements and start designing those parts and then um, machine CNC machine them out. So I'm kind of filming these things out of order, I apologize, but I think I mentioned earlier in order to get the uh, curve around the front in this plane that I intended to cut a series of slots which I now know is called kerf bending and I looked up sort of how to do it because I wasn't sure uh, how many lines and the spacing and how deep and that sort of thing. So I did it uh, according to what I saw on the internet and when I went to bend it, uh, it broke. This is one of those situations where it actually helps to know what you're doing. And since I clearly don't, this is the kind of result I get. So um, what I did to mitigate that was I cut a series of 
and you'll see pictures of it without the stain because like I said I'm going out of order now. I cut a series of these curves and I had some uh, problems cutting them and they got messed up and uh, in the end though I was able finally to um, to make this piece and it unfortunately it doesn't have the look that I want because these are all end pieces now instead of along the grain. Uh, and I also thought that I wanted a certain look and I wanted to uh, stain these separate from the rest of the unit. So uh, what I did was I uh, tacked it and then sanded it. Mosquitoes. Uh, tacked it into place with four little pieces, uh, four little drops of glue. And to my surprise, that glue holds really well. So if you're wondering, is glue enough to hold the speaker together? I'm pretty sure it is. I wasn't sure if I needed some nails or something, but I don't think I do because just four little dots and I had a hard time getting it back off. Uh, so what I did is I, I put all these pieces together and got them all glued together. Then I put it on, tacked it like I said, sanded the whole thing as one so it came out nice and neat. And then I popped it back off and did this staining. And I'll show you now uh, why that's not gonna work for me. All right, so like I said, I'm not a wood worker, but what I want is for these two pieces to have a quarter inch slot in them across and across and across and they need to match up because something's going to go in one side and then over to the other side. So I thought the best way to do it to make sure of that was to clamp them together and cut those at the same exact time and I, that way I know they're all in the same location and the same spacing and everything. Um, but this is a little cumbersome and it I really kind of wanted this one to be deeper than that one, but I found a compromised depth and I'm going to use my little makeshift uh, router table there to do it and we'll see how it goes. So miraculously that seems to have worked. Pretty happy with that. Check out my shirt. I think I'm kind of glad I don't do word working. There's a lot more dust and it really gets airborne unlike steel which just kind of falls to the ground. All right, so I need to do some assembly, and I think to do the assembly, I need to do a little bit of pre-assembly, to be honest, because um, some pieces are gonna be easy to get to when they're like this, but not so easy when they're assembled. It'll be like down in a pocket or something like that. So I'm thinking about sort of pre-drilling the holes for the speaker that goes in here and a few other things. And so I have to think through, I guess, very carefully about how I put it together. All right, so here's the tweeter, and you'll have to remember there's like there are walls like this. I have this screw hole here to great to attach to the speaker, and that's about it. There's just nowhere else to do anything. So I was thinking about doing an L up to here, but I'm afraid that with the vibration it'll do it'll do this sort of a thing if it isn't held in two places. Um, I could go here and then to this wall, but that's still basically a flop this way. I mean, it'd be better if it went across this way or this way. Across this way runs into um, this speaker, which will be in the way, and across that way runs into these outputs here. So I just have to try and uh, come up with something. All right, so this is the kind of bracket I came up with as an idea to secure the, the tweeter in place. And I'll just make this out of a fairly thick material to keep it from vibrating and to make sure it's stiff enough so that it doesn't flex or anything. And uh, I'll leave a little space here. It goes over the top of that center um, terminal. And I'll leave enough space there where I can slide this in and out because I'm not 100% certain exactly where this wall fa falls. So this uh, piece of stained yeah. This piece of stained wood here, when I first did it and I put it up against this raw wood, I immediately knew that's the look I wanted. I love that sort of contrast between the dark and the light. And so I decided to go with that. But after I did this and I made these sort of grill pieces, uh, you couldn't really see that anymore. So my wife suggested that I make the top part um, brown to get that effect. And so I did that with this piece and this and this piece to get that effect. And... Uh, I kind of, even though it's got a yin and yang thing going on, this joint here would be kind of a yin and yang thing. I, I don't like it. So I think I'm just going to wind up staining the whole, the whole thing. And to get rid of some of these lines and to soften what's going on here in this big transition, because this is a little darker, I guess because it's end grain versus this. Uh, 
I've cut these pieces that go on sort of like a grill uh, of their own to mimic the grill that's over there. So it'll kind of go on there like that, or maybe like that, I'm not sure yet to see. <clears throat> um, and I hope that's going to sort of soften up, and I can also make this part a little bit darker when I go over this a second time. I wanted a portion of the Art Deco speaker to glow with the LEDs on the board. The original idea was just to run a light pipe to those spots and hover over the LEDs on the board. But after I considered where the board would have to go, I realized that that light pipe was going to have to be way too complicated to make. So I went with my other option, which was to remote mount the LEDs. Well, the LEDs on this board are teeny tiny surface mount, uh, surface mount LEDs, which I destroyed getting off, so there's no chance of just moving those. And I wasn't 100% certain if the teeny tiny resistors on here were going to be enough to handle the current of these larger LEDs. I, I, think they are, I think they're all the same, but I'm not 100% certain, so I ran them through a couple of t potentiometers to add some resistance. I always like to use as much resistance as possible to get the light output that I'm interested in because a lot of times you can almost use double the resistance that's called for, but, uh, but you'll, you won't really see any difference in the light output. So I like to do that because it'll handle any voltage changes that may happen and also it just increases the life of the LEDs. And in this case, I kind of want a low glow anyway, so if they put out a little less um, light, then that would be just fine with me. On the board, what would happen is when I turn it on and there's no connection to my phone, a blue and a red blink alternately. I have a blue and a red LED here. If everything goes properly, when I turn this on, one of these is going to blink intermittently. The reason both of them won't is I'm not certain if, I, if I've got them reversed or not. So I put one one way and one the other way. So one is guaranteed to be reverse biased. There's also a chance that neither one of them will link because I have too much resistance or I've destroyed something. So let's see what happens. Okay, nothing is happening and that really sucks because I actually have no way of knowing right now if the board is on. <laughs> I mean, uh, oh, okay, let's see, did I, ah, I didn't actually fully connect it, so. Let's try that again. All right, something blink. Nothing's blinking. All right, I'm gonna try the blue one first. I get nothing. All right, now I'll try the red one. I get nothing. Well, doesn't that just suck? Okay, I figured out what I did wrong. I forgot to turn it on. I keep forgetting it takes more than power. There's a button too, so <laughs> let's see what happens now. Come on, baby. Do some blinking for me. Yeah, I don't see anything there. I think it should be blinking by now. It should have, there's, but it should have been some like flickering or something pretty much right off the bat. So I'm gonna try the blue one first by turning it uh, completely Okay, down. I found the problem. Uh, it seemed odd to me that removing an indicator light could cause the system to stop working, but Apparently, data was moving through that LED in order to uh, to light it up at the right rate, and uh, so when it's interrupted, the data is interrupted and it doesn't work, and that's why my phone can't connect. And I'm absolutely certain that's what happened because uh, I went to see if I could check where the the LEDs on this board are not a part of the um, Bluetooth module. They're actually on this board. So I went looking for an output on this board that goes to the LEDs. I found it, and when I when I went to that pin, I don't know which one it is. It's just four up from the bottom. There's four and five actually. But when I got to four, I could actually see on the board here where I had blown that trace. And so, like I said, I guess it wasn't just an indicator. The data must flow through that. Uh, so I guess you can't replace these those with these. Uh, even if you add extra resistance or you have that a lot more resistance I don't know I still can't find it on the internet where it says you shouldn't do that or the difference 
you know, all the differences between these LEDs and surface mount LEDs are like packaging and lower, you know, higher inef efficiency and all this other stuff, but in the view angle and that kind of thing. But nobody says anything about, you know, what you need to put in there as a resistance. Um, I have used SMDs before, uh, almost that small in, in my car. And I used regular um, resistors and I used a regular calculator to do it and it worked just fine. So I, I don't know, I, I didn't know the values. So maybe that's it. Maybe I needed an extra, you know, kill, um, kill ohm or something, I, whatever. Anyway, this board's blown and that's why I can't communicate. And I could probably try and drop in a new module since it's, it's on this board where the damage is and then get this working again because it's like 99% good. I'm sure the amp and everything still works fine. But I'm just not sure 15 bucks it's really worth doing that. So my next plan I think is buy another board because I had two, but I've already put the other one in something. I don't want to take it apart. And so I'll probably just buy another board and I'll go back to the light pipe idea again. Maybe I can use some like fiber optics that's flexible and, and just sort of glue it on there and then get up to where I need to and glue it on there and you know, see if that works to get to do what I want it to do. But until then, I guess the project's at a standstill. I thought I shot video of this already, but I don't see it anywhere, so maybe I didn't turn the camera on or something silly. I don't know, but uh, this back piece has the batteries on it, and it needs to because I need to pull them out and take them out and charge them and that sort of thing, right? The rest of it uh, is best if it stays stationary. That way I don't have a lot of movement of the wires that go to the speakers and that sort of thing that could wear them out. Uh, so I wanted to keep that to a minimum. But the problem I had is I was going to put this on a hinge, but when I went to do that, it wouldn't open because the battery hits over here and more or less the same that side. And uh, I couldn't go this way either because of the same reason. And I thought, well, I could make a drawer and slide it out, but then I needed these sort of rails and it just, it just none of it was really working for me. And finally, I thought maybe I'd have to undo everything I did and then try and come up with another way. but. Then I finally came up with these magnets, and they're actually working quite well. Uh, if you put it in, it um, kind of clicks into place and stays there. I think I might put one more, and the hole lines up now with that. And as long as it doesn't rattle around, and I think I can put a little gasket in there. And again, I think I'll have one more magnet here somewhere that's going to hold the third point. Uh, we'll have to see when I turn it on whether or not it makes any noise, but I was really quite pleased with with how that goes on. I mean, it holds very well. These magnets are very strong. They're uh, called rare earth magnets or uh, neodymium magnets. And I'll show you here what, oops, I'll show you here what I've done with the electronics. So I just glued on this little uh, wooden platform on which to mount the board. These are the fiber optics that uh, are supposed to take the two LED lights here and send it to uh, the front somewhere. And it didn't work out the way I'd hoped. I'm not real happy with it. And I'm not even sure it's even going to be visible. Um, it's not that critical. Um, so we'll see what happens and what I'm going to do with that later. But I did put them in uh, and, in, in case that works. And then the, here's all the wiring. It comes down here. My, it all goes down through the bottom. I put the uh, four uh, resistors down in there. I'm pretty sure. Let me look at the, yep, the screen. I think it's there. And all of the other ones are coming down this way. And what they'll do is they'll come up and go into here where the speakers are. And uh, I'll probably trim them to length at that point. And none of that stuff will move. Uh, well, basically, I think uh, the plan is to leave it on. And then the power will just be cut using the switch, which goes on the front of the unit uh, right here. And I haven't put those things together. I'm almost ready to put those together, but I, I decided to, you know, like I told you earlier, I decided to stain the whole thing. So I've taped up these holes. I'm going to close this all up, stain it, and then I can finish the assembly, and then I'll pretty much be done.
So if you're wondering about the magnets, these are them. I'm going to move it out because I'm not sure where it's focusing. But uh, these I bought because I had a hard time with these flat ones. They're so uh, sort of shiny and non-porous that I had trouble getting glues to stick to them. So I bought these ones with a hole and uh, basically a countersink in it so that I could screw them on, as you can see right here which is good and bad. It's good because it allows you to uh, mount them easily with screw and, and firmly, but it's bad because it makes these things rather fragile. Just dropping it to the floor from here will certainly destroy it. I know I've already gone through a couple of them, um, but it's kind of handy for this. One of the problems with a uh, system like that, though, is if you want to use two magnets to get really good stick instead of, say, a magnet on metal, uh, they you can't screw them in the on one side and then the other side because then they're repelling each other. It wants to flip the same way, so you have to overcome that. Um, but I think usually people just use a metal plate like that. So I brought it into the house because nothing will dry in 85% humidity, and so this stain is still a little bit sticky, and I don't think I can uh, poly it. Like this one's really old and it's nice and dry, uh, this, this part along here. Um, these aren't really attached yet. They'll be straight when I do it. Anyway, um, I just need it to dry up, and but now that I have it inside and I'm looking at it with the brown and the black, I really like the shape, but I don't think I care for the brown and the black. I think I liked it better blonde. I like the contrast that it had before. I'm even considering, once it gets there and I poly it, to just turn around and spray paint it, maybe white or something. Also, if I did that, I could fill these gaps. I mean, they'll get a little better when it's fully assembled, but you're still going to see a little bit of gap here. And I could fill that in, spray paint it white, and you'd never even see it. So, I don't know. Leave in the comments what you think. Uh, this is kind of Art Deco. I mean, they, they were dark brown like this generally. I don't know about the black accents, but... Yeah, I'm not so sure about the color. So... I'm finished staining it and it hit the uh, polyurethane on the outside here. Um, as I mentioned, I kind of liked it better light, the contrast between light and dark. Uh, so I asked my wife what she thought, and she thought it looked better this way and that I should leave it. Um, but I'm the man of the house, and this is my project, so I make the decisions. So I decided to um, do what my wife said and leave it this way, because that's what I want. When I was younger, I'd say <clears throat> in the late 80s, early 90s or so, I used to watch a show where this guy explained things really well. As an example, he was explaining data transfer, I think it was with a fax machine. <clears throat> and a colleague of his stood on one hill with a long white roll of paper with black marks on it, like uh, black, white, black, black, white, sort of binary, if you will. On the other hill, but within sight, he stood in front of a long white pristine roll with a black can of paint. They would walk at the same rate, and when his colleague raised a black flag and he saw it, he would paint black. When he lowered the flag, he would stop painting black. And of course, at the end, his paper looked pretty much like the original paper of his colleagues. I thought this was a really neat and easy way to express the concept and make people understand it. A lot of times when he went on to the next level, he'd have to create a little circuit. And when he did, he liked to adorn them with these little miniature figurines. I really liked that idea, gave it a lot of personality, so I decided to adapt the Hobbit, the habit myself. And as you can see here, I put a little guy right here working on the auxiliary port, and another little guy down there working on the magnet. If anybody knows uh, this show, I'd really appreciate uh, you putting it in the comments because I don't know the name, I don't know the name of the guy, but uh, it was a really cool show, and I want to give credit where credit's due. Until then, thank you for the idea, whomever you are. So this circuit is about as simple as it gets. I'll put a little circuit diagram on there if I remember, but I mean, like I said before, basically you've got uh, an input from the battery, which goes through a switch to the voltmeter. Um, this is, I've marked the red terminal with the positive and the black terminal with the negative. And everything that needs power gets off, comes off of here in a parallel fashion. So there's an LED at the top and of course the voltmeter itself. And then the negative just comes back to the battery. The outputs go from here through the resistors and to both sides of the speakers. I mean, that doesn't get any simpler than that, really. <laughs>
So anywhere I had wood screws, I just screwed them into the wood and assumed that it would hold. But anywhere I had a nut and a bolt, like these places here, I put some Loctite on there to make sure they didn't uh, vibrate loose. So as I mentioned before, these little slots aren't all cut to the same depth. You can even see how this one's much deeper than that one. This is the shallowest one, so I've installed this piece first. And then I put a bar that's uh, parallel to the edge. And so all of the pieces will be straight if I just put them all in bumping up against this bar. So here it is. This is getting close to the end of the video, but I just wanted to make a few comments about the build that I didn't show due to time uh, constraints. Uh, the speakers actually need some kind of a gasket to seal them against the wood in the front. The mid-range came with its own gasket, which was actually mounted on the backside because they didn't expect you to mount them the other way around, and I had to painstakingly scrape it all off and put it on the front side. The tweeter, of course, was all it was didn't have one. It was all worn out from being in the car for so many years. So I was able to make one out of this very thin, sort of foamy stuff that came as uh, some packaging. So that worked out really well. And the ceiling was really important for how it, sound, uh, how it sounded, so uh, you'll hear that in a minute. Some of these other items, like uh, the switch, I was very happy to find. I looked under uh, rotary switches, because I thought if I put in switches, I'd just get a whole bunch of modern and new stuff. But they used a lot of rotary switches back in the day, and so that was the first one that came up. And I thought it was perfect right off the bat. But it was a little, little expensive. It was like $11, and I was thinking maybe I'd get something closer to 2 or 3 It's just a switch after all. And I looked through hundreds of them, and honestly, it was the only one that matched. And in the end, I decided I just had to have it. Um, been fortunate enough to have a uh, surplus store um, in town, and they had both a little uh, light bulb and this voltmeter. Ironically, uh, or amazingly, this uh, voltmeter is from 1969. So, yeah, 50 years old, and it was brand new in the box. So I managed to find a brand new 50-year-old voltmeter panel mount voltmeter and it works great, looks great, and it's perfect for this unit, I think. Um, the bulb was pretty common style bulb to be used in all kinds of equipment all the way through the 50s, 60s, even the 70s, 80s, and I'm guessing even to the 90s. And um, when I powered it up using the incandescent bulb that came with it, it had this wonderful sort of soft green glow that I really, really liked and I thought it was perfect for the unit. Um, I may have mentioned earlier that I did a test with this and it ran for about 12 hours continuously. So I divided the um, 1900 milliamp hour battery life by the 12 hours that it ran and I think that comes up to like 158 milliamps. So basically when I was running this at a volume I was happy with it drew about 158 milliamps on average. The light, the little light bulb, 200 milliamps. So yeah, using a 250, uh, 200 milliamp bulb in there would have literally halved my battery life. It drew more than the entire rest of the thing put together. So uh, I actually considered it because I liked it so much. Um, I thought, well, you know, six hour battery life, that's not too bad, but I just, I couldn't give up that much power. So uh, reluctantly I put an LED inside of the bulb, uh, inside of the, the little green diffuser thing. And I was very happy to find that it was the little green diffuser that did most of the work and the LED looked 90% as good as the incandescent bulb. So I went with that and the current draw was seven milliamps. So yeah, I saved 190, 193 milliamps by using an LED. And that folks is why, you know, they use LEDs these days, right? It saves a ton of energy. So uh, finally, uh, I wanted to discuss the cost a little bit. All along the way, I was really happy with how everything was going because, you know, the switch was only $11 and the whole board was only $14 and, and the wood at uh, Home Depot was only a few dollars and that uh, was only $5 and that was $2. And you know what happens when you add all that up? Are you sitting down? $145. <laughs> That's right. It cost me $145 to make this cheap Bluetooth speaker. I think it was actually kind of worth it. It was just a little bit of sticker shock and I was actually being a little bit conservative when I said that because in the price I did include the battery chargers. Now if you already had rechargeable batteries and you're able to reuse your charger, you could take those costs out. And I included the cost of both of them. You could also do the charging with just one so you could save some money there. However, these two uh, cans of uh, stain and polyurethane were each $13 for a total of 26. 
Now, I'm not sure you can handle this. Money is kind of fungible thing, you know, so I didn't use it all. I only used maybe a tenth of it. So I could have said, okay, $13, I'll only use $1.30 of it. Not a big deal. Same thing may go for this. But the, you may have heard me mention ad nauseum that I don't work with wood, and I'm afraid that this is going to wind up sitting on my shelf, never to be used again. So what I decided to do, unlike this one, which probably would be used again, I attributed the entire $13 from this can, but not this can, to the cost of this project. And I didn't actually even include the cost of this can, the one I'm pointing at, because I actually used this can. And the reason I used this can, allow me to explain. In the bottom, I thought, you know, Minwax, Minwax, right? In the bottom, it says right here, special instructions for polycrylic. Should not be applied over red mahogany stain. That's the only stain they mention that it cannot be applied over. Guess what color that is? Right. So I bought this stain to go over the, uh, this poly to go over the top of the stain. And I guess one of these is kind of wasted. I don't know, hopefully I can use it on something else, but um, yeah, so I put a breakdown of the costs in the uh, description. You can see what I did and didn't charge to it. Uh, but a large part of the cost was actually the batteries. All right, so enough talking. I imagine you probably want to know what this thing sounds like. So let me uh, just power that up then. You may notice when I turn it on, the soft green light I mentioned in the voltmeter should jump up to about 10. And it should stay there. Uh, pretty much until the batteries die. That's the nature of nickel metal hydride batteries. And now I'll put on some of that wonderful royalty free music everybody likes so much. It's the same song I've been using all along. Enjoy. Keep pushing you away while I want you to stay. Amazing God is I. Say no is yes, I'm putting you to the test Can you handle me? Do you have the key? Sorry that I've been playing games Do you really have what it takes? I guess so, I guess so I guess so, I guess so I am a queen, I need my king Are you bad enough to sin? I think so, I think so I think so, I think so you enjoyed that. It was my intention to sell this Bluetooth speaker to try and recoup some of the cost, but my wife and I just sort of fell in love with it, so we decided to go ahead and keep it. And FYI for the record, I don't smoke and I'm not wearing any pants.